Hi, Founder fans. Jason here with Michael Troy of the American Revolution podcast to continue our discussion on the major generals of the Continental Army. We last time spoke about the top four ranking generals, and now we're moving on to the next three in line. So, Michael, thank you so much for coming back. Thanks. Happy to be here. And let's get into it. The number four ranking general, uh, five ranking general in the Continental Army was... Uh, Major General Richard Montgomery. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about him. First of all, uh, is Richard Montgomery a native North American, or has he been around the world? He is an Irishman. He was born in Ireland. Um, he, he was a Protestant, so that was acceptable to the crown, but uh, um, yeah, he, he was from Ireland. His father was in the Irish Parliament. Um, and he was also a regular uh, officer in the regular army. So he comes from uh, a, a military background, and that's you know kind of where he got his start. He um, came from a, a pretty well-off family. As I said, they were in Parliament. So yeah, even it's the Irish Parliament, which isn't the big show. Um, <laughs> they, they did pretty well for themselves. And um, Richard actually went to college for a few years, which is pretty unusual for the time, um, but he quit school when the um, Seven Years' War started, and dad bought him a ensign's commission in the army, and that's where he got to start. So he, he, he jumps in as a, lo a very low-level officer, but an officer nonetheless. Uh, and then yeah. I, I understand his first action was in North America? Yes, he gets sent to North America uh, during the Seven Years' War. He's involved, I think the biggest thing he was involved in was the Siege of Lewisburg. Um, and uh, I think it was after that that he gets promoted to lieutenant. And um, he gets promoted again during the war, so he finishes up as a captain in the British Army. Interesting. And then... Um... I know he sails around the world a little bit. I don't know if I don't recall if he makes it all the way around. At the at the end of the at the end he does most of his tour in North America, but at when North America wraps up about three years before the rest of the war ends, um, and a lot of the troops went to the West Indies, and he was one of those soldiers. So he ended up participating in uh, the capture of Martinique from the French, the island in the Caribbean, and. Um, after Martinique fell, the French basically handed over a few other smaller islands around it. So he was part of that whole process of, of taking over those islands. So he makes a name for himself, as many future American uh, generals do, serving in the British Army. Uh, but then shortly before the hostilities actually erupt with the American Revolution, uh, Richard Montgomery, like many other British officers, uh, decides to uh, resign his commission and relocate to New York, of all places. Well, he, he actually gets transferred back to New York at the end of the war with his unit. He, he spends a little time there. Uh, it's about that time that he meets um, Robert Livingston, um, and more importantly, Robert Livingston's daughter, Janet. Um, they get to know each other a little bit at that point. Uh, but then he returns back to Britain. He does not stay in New York after the war. He goes back to, um, lives near London, I believe, not actually in the city, but near it. Um, starts hanging out with a bunch of radical Whigs. Um, and actually gets engaged to be married while he's in Britain as well. Um, and it turns out his fiance cheated on him. And so he broke off the relationship uh, he also decided that um, he wasn't getting promoted after the war. He couldn't afford to buy a higher rank, and he didn't have the connections to, to kind of move up. So he ends up selling his captaincy and moving to New York about 10 years after the war ends. So he spends a fair amount of time in Britain. Um, but he moves to New York and decides to become a gentleman farmer, and he vows never to marry. Um, and two years later, marries Janet Livingston. Right. <laughs> uh, yes, so, very notably marries Janet Livingston, making him a member of the larger Livingston clan, if you will, who was arguably the most important family in New York at the time. 
So it's a they very, were all very important and yeah. very wealthy and very politically connected family. Yes. Right. Because her father, Robert, there were a bunch of Robert Livingstons, and her father, Robert, uh, I believe I'm correct in saying, was the Lord of Livingston Manor at the time, uh, as opposed to Robert Livingston, who would go on to be Chancellor of New York and help write the Declaration and such. He was a, yeah, he was a very large landowner. I don't know exactly what his title was, but, but yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So the, the Livingston family, I like to say that New York was a feudal society because it was a holdover from the Netherlands from a century earlier where uh, they owned literally all the land. So uh, it was, it literally acted like feudal manners from what we consider the Middle Ages. Um Although we like to think that the revolutionaries were a lot nicer than the kings of old. Uh, but yeah, so when you married into the Livingston family, you were literally marrying into the closest thing the colonies had to royalty, I would argue. Um, yeah, I, I would relate it more to like the Southern aristocracy, where you, you basically had a very small number of families that controlled pretty much all the land and uh, the people who worked it in in New York, I think were more tenant farmers than as opposed to African slaves, but their condition was not actually a lot better in terms of at least political power. They had to please the owner of the land or they could find themselves, you know, kicked off and without, you know, anything to survive. Right. And it's funny you mentioned that uh, Montgomery wanted to be a gentleman farmer because usually you more associate that with the South, as you were saying. Uh, you don't usually consider, you know, in the North, there was more, especially New England, more family farms, not necessarily that the yeoman idea that they carried further south. Now, as I said, the, the New York system, I think, was a lot closer to the south than it was New England. New England was really its own thing and very different from pretty much the rest of the entire empire, for that matter. Yeah, that's um, but yeah. fair enough. Yeah. So uh, he moves in. He's now a colonist. He's married into the Livingston family, and uh, Richard Montgomery finds himself surrounded by a war breaking out. Uh, I am under the understanding that he was not very eager to join the fight. Yeah, he gets married in 1773, so it's really only a couple years before the war begins. Um, he was elected to the New York Provincial Congress, so he was kind of involved in the in the political effort, but he he really had no great desire to um, go go into the army and, and serve as an officer. Uh, the um, Continental Congress was trying to figure out who they were should be picking for, for the top officers, and they really didn't know who to pick from New York at all. And so they actually asked the New York Provincial Congress, and some of his colleagues recommended him. You know, after all, he had been a captain in the regular army, which even though it's not a particularly high rank, it did give him a lot of military experience. So uh, he ended up um, taking the job, but yeah, he wasn't exactly enthusiastic and going after or anything. It's kind of interesting though, one of the things he did say was uh, he really did not think Schuyler should be a, a major general. He really kind of went after Schuyler a little bit there at the beginning. Oh, I've never come across that. That makes some strange sense. Because if he was yeah. with the Livingston family, Schuyler was more north with the uh, the Rensselaers uh, and, and that crew, as opposed to the Mid-Hudson and the Livingstons. Yeah, I'm not sure how much of it was political and how much it may have been that he just genuinely didn't believe Schuyler was capable of, of doing it. And, you know, he said Schuyler had a lot of things going for him, but he really didn't have a lot of military field combat experience in, in right. leading men. And he was kind of worried about that. Right. It, it, you know, as we discussed last time, he, Skyler really didn't have any experience. He had a little bit, but not actually in the field. Uh, but yeah, so Montgomery becomes another, as we keep bringing up, uh, these former British citizens who have just recently left the army, handed in their commission and moved to North America. Uh, just one of several officers that ends up being asked to join the fight. And though, though he did it reluctantly, he does join the fight and he goes to serve uh, he, he's immediately appointed a brigadier general and goes to serve yeah. under uh, that same Schuyler he was asking questions about oh so recently. 
Yeah, the conventional wisdom was always that, you know, British regulars were far superior to militia officers and that sort of thing. So anybody that had any kind of experience as an officer in the regular army was immediately, you know, even if they were just a lieutenant, they were held up as, you know, this is somebody that we really should put front and center in our new army. Uh, but yeah, you're right. He does go, um, is deployed almost right away. Uh, he's serving under Schuyler, and they have a good relationship. It's not like Schuyler, you know, there was some sort of tension between them because of this, this lack of a recommendation at the beginning. Um, and um, Montgomery takes command of Fort Ticonderoga, which of course was famously captured by uh, Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen. And um, Congress wanted to very quickly get that into the hands of a New York officer. They wanted to get the New Englanders out of there. Right. You know, that that time New England invaded New York a few months earlier. Yeah, that had to be remedied. <laughs> Too sweet, as they say. Uh, yeah. So he does that. And now he's essentially sitting there and then Boston is being seized and the decision is made to invade Canada. Yeah, Montgomery actually starts that on his own, really. He doesn't even consult Schuyler, uh, but he learns that the British are building two warships up at the north end of Lake Champlain. And he obviously realizes that those can be used against the Americans in an invasion force. So he takes uh, the better part of his garrison up Lake Champlain to capture those ships. And then he ends up slowly kind of moving into St. John's and up toward Montreal and... Um, you know, he's kind of waiting for uh, get really permission to do what he's doing already um, from Schuyler and from the Continental Congress and all that. Uh, and they eventually do back his move and, and realize that he's doing the right thing there. But yeah, he, he really got the whole thing started on his own. That's amazing. Because yeah, the Continental Congress basically gets letters and they're like, what do you mean we invaded Canada? <laughs> uh, oh, wait, he's doing good. OK, let's send him some soldiers. Uh, yeah, and famously he does a pretty fantastic job, uh, and it's uh, while he's on. I understand it's while he's on his way to Quebec, he is then promoted to the position we are discussing in this series, which is major general. Well, he is still a brigadier for most of the time he's on the Quebec campaign. Um, he. Uh, um, Congress really doesn't know, I guess he, he starts this campaign, I guess, in September. Uh, he's not appointed a, a major general until the beginning of December, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, Congress is kind of waiting to see what happens and um, not really sure how this whole thing is going to turn out. You got to remember the, the force, the British force in Canada at this time was really small. There were not a whole lot of um, British regulars. I think there were like maybe the equivalent of about two, two and a half regiments in the entire um, area that is today Canada. And most of them were in and around Quebec, but still that's not very many. And Montgomery's able to go in and capture uh, Montreal without much of a fight. Uh, he almost captures uh, General Carleton. Uh, he actually, his men have the ship surrounded that Carleton's on with most of Carleton's army also on the ship. And um, Carleton's only able to escape. We talked about this when we talked about Carleton, but he, he dons civilian garb and poses as a Frenchman and sneaks back to Quebec, leaving his army to be taken prisoner. So... Carlton's down to almost nobody because he's lost all his regulars and he's only got a handful of companies in Quebec City to defend the entire um, city. And at the same time Montgomery's making his way up, uh, you have Colonel Benedict Arnold emerging from the main wilderness on the other side of Quebec, ready to capture it as well. And um, things are looking mighty bleak for, for General Carlton up there. And um, it's only the arrival of some... Uh, Canadian loyalist militia who are a bunch of Scottish Highlanders who really uh, prevent the city from surrendering. They were just about ready to do that. And they, they take, um, you know, give support to Carleton and hold the city. So at that point, uh, General Montgomery, who's the senior American commander, um, 
is still trying to take Quebec City, but but really unable to do so. And they end up besieging the city for a couple of months until December. Right. Uh, Bam, before we carry on with that, I do want to note that, again, this is 1775. Like, George Washington is still just sitting outside Boston, parading his soldiers around. And Richard Montgomery has not only prevented the leader Carlton of of British Canada from building these ships, he's captured the Canadian army. I, again, it's not the Canadian army, it's the British army, but he captured Carlton's entire army with a very small army of his own and has now, you know, I recommend people look at a map of Canada to see just how far up he got to get to Quebec. Uh, and, you know, as you said, he never actually, I think we've mentioned this uh, previously, he never actually finds out he's a major general. They pass that in early December in Philadelphia, and by the time word arrives, uh, well, the siege of Quebec has turned into a battle, and uh, I'll let you take it from there if you want. Yeah, the situation, despite their victories, is becoming rather desperate because they know the British are going to be sending over um, lots and lots of reinforcements in the spring. And at that point, if the Americans aren't in control of Quebec City, they're never going to be. So they're really desperate to capture it. And Montgomery's having a whole bunch of problems, part of which is um, a lot of his... Uh, Army is becoming sick at this point, smallpox and other diseases. Another big problem is that a great many of the people he has serving under him were enlisted for very short terms and were um, trying to get home. Uh, nobody wants to be out in the field in Canada in December. It's just, it's really cold and these guys don't have coats. Uh, so Hockey season though, what's wrong? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, everybody wants to go home. Yeah. And uh, the bulk of his army uh, is going to turn into a pumpkin on January 1st. All the enlistments are going to end, and his army is pretty much going to dissolve. So he really has a deadline to get Quebec captured by December 31st. And out of desperation, he and Arnold um, planned an attack on Quebec City for the last week of December. They have to put it off several times because of weather problems and other problems. And, you know, finally, it's the night of December 31st, and it's it's do or die time. And so they launch an attack against Quebec City. And unfortunately, there was more dying than doing. Um, General uh, Montgomery leads an attack, uh, uh, the first assault on Quebec City. Uh, the British blast his line with a cannon full of grape shot. He takes grape shot to the head and is killed almost instantly. Just as soon as they go break breach the walls of the city, he's. My understanding yeah. is he's he died like as soon as everything gets going. Yeah, basically what happened was uh, Montgomery had marched up his force up the southern side of the walled city and was getting ready to attack from the south. Arnold had marched up the north side of the city and was getting ready to attack from the north at the same time. And as soon as they launched their attack, Montgomery's killed instantly. Arnold is shot and injured very badly, um, almost at the same time. And um, the people who were with Arnold, several of his officers are also killed at the same time he is. So the, the line is pretty badly decimated and his line just flees the the, the survivors flee. Uh, they're gone. And Arnold is still trying to attack. He's injured and he's still trying to press his men forward. And, and many of the men do enter the town, uh, led by a colonel by the name of Daniel Morgan. And they uh, make some rest, but they're, they're, they're too small a number. There's only a few hundred of them that actually get into the city. And there's the British far outnumber them. And they eventually surround and trap the Arnold's men who did get, get into the city and take them all prisoners. So it's really a complete failure for the Americans. Right. On all fronts, your, your leading generals are either dead or, you know, severely wounded. One of the most famous colonels, I'm glad you brought up, uh, Daniel Morgan, because, uh, you know, at this point, most of the army is still people from the north. They're trying to recruit from the south. 
but this is very early in the war, and they're mostly from the north, except a few regiments from out on the frontier decided to come hang out and help, including Daniel Morgan. So I'm glad we got him a shout-out. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, um, the Continentals sent up a few companies of riflemen, a few from Virginia and a few from Pennsylvania, and that was really about it from outside of New England at this time. And yeah, Morgan was one of them. I, and I actually read this really interesting story. I don't know how verified it's been, but Morgan was the last man to surrender in Quebec, and he was surrounded by a group of, of British soldiers who basically had him at bayonet point, were getting ready to just kill him, and he was just swinging his rifle butt at them and trying to provoke them and fight them and refuse to surrender, and they were demanding his sword. He told them they'd be, he'd be damned if he turned over his sword to a British soldier or something, and they ended up having to bring in a Catholic priest, and he said, and he said he'd He'd give the sword to the priest, and the priest could give it to the soldiers because he was not going to hand over his sword to the enemy. That's, That's the only reason. Yeah, the, the fact well, that they put up with that was the only reason he lived through that. They very easily could have just bayoneted him. And killed yeah, him. you'd think they would have. <laughs> Although Morgan's one of those people who, at this point, is starting has uh, kind of grown a larger than life, uh, uh, become a little bit more, a little bit mythical <laughs> in his stature in history. Um, he was a big guy, too. You really wouldn't want to mess with him in hand-to-hand -hand combat, even if you had six or seven guys against just him. Yeah, I understand that no one alive today would want to mess with anyone alive back then for hand-to-hand -hand combat. They just <laughs> lived a lot tougher. Like, even the fancy pants boy people, <laughs> they still live very tough lives. Um, yeah, uh, no, it's, I'm glad you brought up the, the Catholic priest thing, though, too, because one of the reasons you would expect uh, montgomery plowing through canada like this many people thought that canada would join the rebellion pretty easily because they had just been french 15 years beforehand everyone had this idea that hey they'll probably be real eager to throw off the british government um and while it certainly seems like it made it easier for montgomery to uh, get in there it obviously was not true that they were excited to join the rebellion yeah this this was not just a military campaign it was also a political one they had letters from the continental congress saying you know join us brothers in liberty and, and all these great things and they were really trying to encourage the french to join and a few did uh, there's actually two uh, uh regiments of canadians who end up joining the continental army uh, Moses Hazen was uh, probably the most famous leader from that group uh, who ended up becoming a, a brigadier general in the Continental Army. Uh, but most French Canadians really had no desire to fight. Um, they may, may have not been crazy about the British, but they also weren't too crazy about New Englanders uh, who, you know, had an annual Pope's Day where they burned the Pope in effigy and were very anti-Catholic and you know, Massachusetts had had a law that any French or any Catholic priest that entered the colony would be executed immediately at one point. And they'd done away with this law by this time, but but I'm just saying that's the kind of background they're coming from. Yeah, well, um, one of the major problems was the Quebec Act, where they, you know, people from New England were like, what do you mean they get to be Catholic? <laughs> what are you talking about? We're already dealing with, you know, uh, other denom congregationalists over in what Connecticut, <laughs> but uh, the real problem I understand with the Quebec Act was actually the keeping of French laws more than the religion itself. Well, it was just is more the idea that the land was going to the Quebec people rather than the people of Connecticut and Virginia and New York and Pennsylvania and all the others who had claims on that land. Uh, they just weren't happy to see the, you know another colony and. You know, it was a colony that they didn't like and trust. I mean, let's face it, that these other colonies had been fighting Quebec in several wars going back a century at least. Right. So th these were traditional enemies. And the British actually played that up. Governor Carleton was, you know, telling them, you know, remember, these are the people that were slaughtering you in the last war, you know. And, you know, he was bringing up all these anti Catholic screeds and stuff from Boston newspapers and showing it to the local Quebecs and say, you, know, you you really want to trust yourself to these people? Do you really think this is going to go well for you? So they, the, the British did a good job in propaganda as well. And the French basically got to the point where they were just saying, well, you know, we're going to see who comes out the winner and we'll, you know, say we like them because we don't want to get kicked out and lose our land and all that stuff. 
Right. You know, it reminds me, it's also the province of Quebec where certain Native American nations, when they would capture civilians, would bring them to, like, the border of southern Quebec, northern New Hampshire. Like, I know John Stark, as a young man, was taken uh, prisoner while on a hunt uh, and brought to that area, which is another layer of that tradition of unhappiness between those parts of the world. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so... As for Montgomery, that's a pretty brutal conclusion. <laughs> he is he's the first highest ranking uh general to die in the war, I believe. Um, yeah, by by quite a few months, I think at least. Yeah. Um he dies in at the very end of 1775. He never sees 1776. Yeah. Um so yeah, he's the first uh, general officer to be killed in the war. And he is, about three months later, replaced by John Thomas. Now, John Thomas was not one of these former British officers who came to America. He was a colonist, though he did fight in several previous wars. I, If I'm not mistaken, he was a, uh, I believe he was a militia officer in the uh, Seven Years' War in certain previous wars. Uh, yeah, in the, I, I don't think he fought in King George's War. I think it wasn't until the um, um, French and Indian War that he actually fought. He, 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 as you say, he was raised in Massachusetts. He was trained as a doctor, and that's how he made a living. And he took a position as a regimental surgeon in the Massachusetts militia. Um, and that's where he was when the French and Indian War began. But he wasn't content to remain a surgeon. He actually decided to become a field commander and took an, a position as a combat officer in the war. And um, he did, did a lot of fighting in Nova Scotia. And um, he was involved in the, the assault on Montreal uh, during the war. So he, he did see some, some real combat during that, that war. Right. And then he's from, is he from, Bo he's from just outside Boston. I believe. Uh, but he is a Massachusetts man. Yeah, he is from Massachusetts. He's, he does not live in the city of Boston. He's just kind of a small town doctor. I forget which which town he's from. Right. One of one of the ancillary towns hanging out around Boston, um, making him uh, dominate the uh, medical trade in his area, one would assume. Uh, so then the Revolutionary War breaks out. Uh, we don't have we don't have as much of a buildup from him as we had from Montgomery because Montgomery was traveling the world fighting wars and uh, Thomas was living in New England being a physician. <laughs> and Yeah, he really didn't do a whole lot of anything. He wasn't elected to a lot of public offices. Uh, you know, he, he held a militia position, which really didn't mean much in peacetime. Uh, and he was a doctor. That was really about about it. Yeah. But he was a leader of society and uh, as a physician would be because not that many people got educated enough to do that. And. Uh, the, so yeah, you know, he, he was a leader and uh, Congress or the, the, the government of Massachusetts obviously respected him because they and they respected his military background because they appointed him as one of the top generals in the Massachusetts Militia Army in uh, 1775, even before Lexington and Concord, they're putting together an army. I think this was in February. Um, he gets appointed to be second in command of the provincial army in Massachusetts. Right. And that causes a little bit of grief because the Continental Army is created. And uh, well, John Thomas doesn't necessarily get the position he's hoping for. Yeah, he's actually, his rank is a lieutenant general in the Massachusetts militia. He's second in command only to Artemis Ward, uh, who is the commander in chief of the Massachusetts Army. Um, so that, that that's the equivalent of a three-star general today. And the Continental Army offers him a position as a brigadier, a one-star general. So he's taking a massive drop in rank. And he's not even given a very senior position. Um, there are two officers, Massachusetts generals, who are below him in rank in the Massachusetts Army that are giving more senior positions to him in the Continental Army. Uh, one of them is, um, 
No, it wasn't Jeremiah Preble. It was. I um, want to say Pomeroy. Pomeroy, yes, thank you. Pomeroy um, and and William Heath were both um, made more senior to him in the in Congress's initial uh, proposals. Um, Pomeroy, Seth Pomeroy was um, at, at least seventy years old. He was yep. an, he was an older gentleman, but he had a, he had a pretty storied and experienced. Um, um, combat record uh, going back to King George's War, uh, but he he was too old to fight. And even though Congress uh, offered him a commission, he never accepted it. So he never actually served in the Continental Army. Right. Um, and that, that Th Thomas was really kind of apoplectic about you know the fact that he was basically being ranked number four of Massachusetts men in the Continental Army, even though he had been number two. Uh, in the Massachusetts Army, so he he was ready to resign, um, and and he was far from the only one. Uh, there, there's actually an interesting letter from George Washington, like that he sends to Congress about a day or two after he arrives in Boston, basically saying, "I gave General Putnam his commission, and that immediately caused two Connecticut generals to leave, and they like." They, they went back to Massachusetts even without meeting with Washington. And, and so he says, um, so I'm not really handing out any of the other commissions because I don't know what kind of problems it's going to cause. And here's a whole list of all the problems that these are causing. And you guys might want to revisit and reconsider all this before I hand out the rest of these commissions and have half of our general staff walk away in disgust. Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> And um, Thomas is one of these people who's really, really ticked off. Well, and Thomas also felt himself as outranking Putnam also. Whether or not that's true, that's how he felt. <laughs> oh, yeah, he did. But you, you could at least make an argument that, you know, well, we have to bring in somebody from Connecticut. Right. The fact that two other Massachusetts men who were beneath him were being promoted above him was particularly galling. Yeah. So to be fair yeah, to Thomas, Pomeroy, like Pomeroy was in his seventies, but you know, had if they could bring Pomeroy out of retirement, he should be ranked higher based on past service and such. Do you know? Well, what? you can make that argument, but Pomeroy was a major general in the Massachusetts Army at this time, so he was he was a commissioned officer. That's true. And he was under Thomas's command. That's true. As was William Heath. So you know. You could argue that maybe Thomas shouldn't have been put above Pomeroy in the Massachusetts Army, but Thomas wasn't looking at it that way. Thomas was saying, hey, wait a minute. This was one of my subordinate officers, and you're trying to make him my superior. No, that, no, no, no. Yeah. So uh, I understand Thomas tries to resign, but General Washington kind of gives him one of those sly reprimands he's famous for. Yeah, he... he... He at least meets with Washington, which, as I said, several other officers did not. Spencer and Wooster just walked off the field, and never even met with Washington at the time. Uh, Thomas at least goes and talks to the man and tries to, you know, figure out the lay of the land and, and, and give him notice that, yeah, he's probably going to quit if, you know, Congress doesn't respect him properly. Um, Washington writes him a whole letter saying, you know, how much they respect him and love him and, you know, we're going to make some changes real soon. Please stick around. Uh, he gets a letter from General Lee saying pretty much the same thing, you know, for the good of the country, please just accept this. We know it's below your dignity, but, you know, we'll work it out. And Lee puts in this letter also, you know, you know, you know, me personally, I've, I've accepted this, this position that's below my dignity too, because I'm below Artemis Ward and I should really be above him. I'm you glad know, you brought that up. <laughs> holding himself out as an example of humility and giving to the country by taking this lowly command as third in command of the Continental Army. Um, and um, I was going to bring that up too. Uh, like it's selfish, <laughs> selfish Charles Lee. Like one of the best things he probably did in the war was convince Thomas to actually take the lower command. Yeah, and and even the, um, the 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 Massachusetts provincial government really encourages Thomas. Uh, um, the president of Massachusetts, who was um, James Warren at the time, um, writes him another letter saying, you know, please do this for the good of the country, for the good of the army, for the good of the people, and blah blah blah. And he does it, and and the situation does get a little better because Pomeroy doesn't 
take a position. So Thomas immediately is up one rank. And Congress revisits the seniority issue and ends up putting Heath below Thomas in the uh, seniority rankings of brigadiers. So, uh, and, and they actually say that Thomas is to be made the most senior general of the brigadiers, which I find odd because Horatio Gates is more senior to him on the list. But um, there was a, apparently at one point, although Horatio Gates did get his appointment before Thomas as brigadier. Um, Thomas somehow leapfrogs above him for a short time on the brigadier list and then, and then makes major general before uh, Gates does as well. Right. So yeah, he, he basically gets made the most senior brigadier, gets all these promises that there'll be free promotion soon and please for the good of the country, just do it. And he eventually sticks around and yeah. He makes it happen. And then he gets another promotion, but there seems to be a really important reason that he is promoted to major general. Right. Well, um, Thomas is, as I said, he was second in command during the siege of Boston behind Artemis Ward. And Artemis Ward commanded from Cambridge, which is just to the north of Boston. And um, Thomas was given command of the area south of Boston, which included Dorchester Heights. And he continued to command that area after George Washington uh, took command of the Continental Army. Uh, so um, Thomas was in charge of, uh, of of Dorchester Heights. And when Henry Knox arrives with all the cannons, and he's part of the process of of getting Dorchester Heights um, uh, embedded with cannon in a single night, which takes the British by surprise, and of course. Uh, results in the British uh, evacuating Boston. Yeah, so the, he's kind of part of the heroic effort. Uh, he, he doesn't get sole credit for that. Henry Knox takes a lot, obviously, uh, and so a few others. But um, um, yeah, he benefits greatly in reputation for forcing the British to to flee Boston after occupying Dorchester Heights. Yeah, he yeah obviously there are a lot of people involved, but he essentially oversees the operation that gets the cannons that Henry Knox had so politely brought from Ticonderoga. Uh, and he gets on, and, and we should remind people that Boston today, uh, I'm, I'm a broken record, Boston today does not look like Boston 200 plus years ago when it was really a peninsula. <laughs> and Dorchester Heights, the, the thing is, the British woke up in the morning and could see, oh man, look, up on the hill, there's some cannons. They couldn't shoot up to the cannons but those cannons could certainly shoot down at them, which is what makes it such an important uh, uh, operation in the war at this stage. Not, not only could they fire on Boston, they could fire on all the British ships in the harbor. And the, the, the Navy said, yeah, we're out of here now. You guys can come with us if you want to, but we're out of here. We're not going to sit there under the guns of, yeah. of Dorchester Heights for very long. Yeah. So, yeah, and they but, leave in a, a matter of, weeks or days uh it yeah it's not very long it's 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 i think only probably less than a week yeah um they really um, general, want to get out of there yeah i mean general Howe, who's his first um inclination is to try to take dorchester heights to go out march across the neck and charge up the heights and take it or or to um do a water landing one or the other and there's a like a vicious storm that night and they're unable to do it. And I guess he, after he had 24 hours to think about it, he decides better of it. And uh, so he tells uh, the Americans or makes a pronouncement at least to them that uh, if they don't fire on them during the evacuation, they won't burn the city of Boston on their way out. And that's kind of the tacit agreement that the two armies accept that the Americans kind of step back and let the British leave peacefully and the British don't completely destroy the town of Boston. Yeah. We'll see you in New York. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and the much of the fallout from this is Thomas gets his promotion to Brigadier, uh, I'm sorry, to Major General. Right. He's promoted to Major General, I think only a couple of days after the British evacuate yeah. Um, Boston. And, well, um, I'm seeing. Oh, actually, my dates might be messed up because I'm seeing him promoted on March sixth, 
and I was under the impression evacuation was St. Patrick's Day. Um, I'm pretty sure the evacuation was in March. No? Yeah. Let me double check. Bear with us. <laughs> One moment, please. Uh, yeah, March 17th. Oh, okay. Well, so Dorchester Heights was March 4th. He was promoted March 6th, and then they evacuated on the 17th. Yes, yeah, so I don't know if the, the Continental Congress had even gotten word of the victory by the time yeah. they promoted him. He made, um, I, I was always under that impression, but now that we're saying it, it's like, yeah, there's no way they found out in a day. I mean, they didn't even find oh, out about Lexington and Concord that quickly. Yeah, yeah, there's no way Congress would act that quickly. Very interesting. Um, so it must have just been his loud complaints for an entire year that got them to give him. Well, the other big thing was that there was an opening in um, in Quebec. They needed a, a military commander to send up there. And that, that was probably the real reason for his promotion was that they were getting ready to give him an independent command in Quebec. And since he had just been promoted to the highest ranking brigadier general, he leapfrogged Gates to be next in line. Yeah. Um, at the time, uh, Quebec was under the command of Brigadier David Wooster, who, who did get over his conniption about not being, being made a major general immediately and did, did accept his, uh, his position as a brigadier. And he went and um, commanded uh, um, in, in Quebec province for, for a few months and managed to really piss off Benedict Arnold while he was there. But, you know, who doesn't? Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, they weren't really impressed with what Wooster was doing. And Wooster spent most of his time in, in Montreal and left um, Arnold kind of besieging Quebec while he was still really actually healing from his wounds. So he was kind of besieging it from a hospital bed. And then um, Wooster decides to go up to Quebec and, and take over from Arnold and basically tell him to shove off. And Arnold ends up going back to Montreal at that point. It's, so it's this whole mess. The, the officers, the leadership aren't getting along. Half the army's dying of smallpox. They need to send a new commander in there. And they decide John Thomas is the man. He's going to fix this all and, and win Quebec back for us. Right. Uh, and he goes up. By the time he gets there, I'm under the impression that Quebec City itself most of the problem is being evacuated because he goes to Montreal, I believe. Uh, he does. There, there is still an army around Quebec City, a small army, but it's it's not nearly enough to take the city, um, even though the British reinforcements haven't arrived yet. Um, the main American headquarters, if you will, is in Montreal. So that's where Thomas goes. And what he finds is a complete mess. Uh, there's about 1,900 uh, uh, continental soldiers or a mix of continental and militia uh, in Quebec at the time. About half of them are fit for duty. Uh, the other half are uh, um, sick with smallpox. Um, of the thousand or th so that are fit for duty, uh, 300 of them have already had their um, terms of enlistment come to an end. And so they're basically demanding to be let go and refusing to do any Thing for the army. They're basically sitting there on strike. So, you know, Thomas essentially has 600 effectives um, to, you know, and he's supposed to capture Quebec with this. And he realizes that the British uh, Spring Relief Force is going to be there any day. And so a few days after he arrives, he holds a, uh, a, a meeting with his top officers, a council of war, and they decide they have to retreat out of there. Um, because they realized when the British get there with their fleet, the first thing they're going to do is sail down the St. Lawrence, take control of the river. And, you know, the Americans have a thousand sick people in Quebec who, are, you know, they can't really just march them out of there. Um, so the first thing he does is get all the um, sick and wounded and anybody else who isn't fit for duty and gets them back to New York. He also sends all of his artillery back to New York because he knows that's going to be hard to move in a retreat as well. Um, and by about the time that, that all gets done, the uh, British finally do show up at Quebec City uh, and almost immediately go on the offensive, going after the Americans. And the Americans basically are running out of there with their tails between their legs. 
Um, I don't think Thomas actually retreats completely out of Canada himself because uh, while he's there, he gets sick and dies of smallpox. He arrives. He arrived in in Quebec at the beginning of May, and he's dead by the beginning of June. Yeah, so a few really not weeks, not very yeah. long. Yeah, and most of that time he was sick in bed with smallpox. He actually went blind a week or two before he died, so he was just in really difficult shape and and didn't have a chance to do much of anything. Yeah, I, I understand that one of the some of the appeal of Thomas was that he did uh, the men had a ton of respect for him because he would go in and mix with them as opposed to certain other officers who kept with other officers. He would go out with the common soldier, uh, unfortunately, seems to have been his undoing because he did that during the smallpox epidemic that broke out. And, well, as you said, he joins those who catch the smallpox and passes away. I have him uh, dying in, yeah, Quebec, actually. So he never actually completes the retreat. He's only a major general for less than three months because of that. Yeah. And then General Arnold, uh, Brigadier General Arnold, I understand, not only leads the retreat out of Canada, but legend has it is the last person to step out of Canada. Yeah, when um, when General uh, Thomas had arrived in Quebec, General Wooster had another snit fit and left the region entirely and went back to Connecticut. So Arnold became the second in command again. Um, and yeah, Arnold pretty much takes command and is is removing uh, the force out of Quebec, although they do send up um, General Sullivan very quickly. I think he may have actually been in Quebec for a very short time as part of the retreat. But Arnold really is the face of the retreat. He's he's the one moving the men, giving the orders in the field, doing all the hard work. And yeah, there is a story that he was the very last uh, man to, you know, he, he stands there seeing the, the, the British actually literally in sight of him as he's getting ready to cross the river and puts a, a pistol to his horse's head and shoots it to deny it to the enemy, gets in a boat and sails back to New York. It sounds like Arnold. I mean, yeah. at this point, he's the survivor. Like, you know, we've lost two major generals in six months in Canada. Uh, so for the men to see Arnold still there, still kicking, as they say, although that's he did get what shot in the leg. So I guess still kicking is a very tough way to put it. But uh, yeah, I, as I always say, American hero Benedict Arnold was everyone's leader at that point. And that brings us to the third and final person we're discussing today, which is Horatio Gates, who uh, we'll go back and talk about his whole life. But at this point in the story, he is then promoted from Brigadier General to Major General and told to go take over that army we have in Canada, uh, where eventually he'll arrive in Albany and learn there is no army in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he arrives too late to uh, yeah. be part of the uh, Army of Quebec. <laughs> yeah, he gets that, what I call his invisible army. Uh, sorry, Skyler and Arnold break the terrible news. Sorry, bud, your army is in New York. Uh, but before we do that, let's talk about Horatio Gates, who, despite how the war goes for him, is definitely one of the most important characters in the Continental Army. Yeah, I mean, like uh, General Montgomery, he he was a British regular officer. He was born in England and, um, um, you know, had a, a storied career in the British Army before the American Revolution. So he's another one of these people that uh, the Americans are relying on as an experienced professional officer to, you know, help lead the country to um, to victory. Um, he comes from a, his family. He, he he doesn't come from aristocracy, which is you know most officers do, um, but his his parents are well off. Um, his, his father works, uh, I think, with the Customs Bureau in in Britain and holds a high position in there. Uh, his mother was uh, the housekeeper to a duke. Um, and I, I should explain: a, a housekeeper is not somebody who cleans houses in. Um, in this period in England, it's a um, uh, um, 
it's it's kind of a patronage position. It's it's a position that is given to relatively wealthy, influential people. Um, um, it, it's basically managing a household of a, of a high royal um, official. I mean, like a, um, it's not like a butler, more like a mater d. It's not even a servant's role. It's more like I know. A, I didn't um, know what analogy to make up. <laughs> yeah. It's more like a hotel manager, maybe, or something like that. Okay, yeah. But you're basically managing the staff that actually does the work. You're running um, the business of being a noble family. Right, running the household, managing yeah. the servants, making sure everything gets done that's supposed to get done. Um, and, yeah, so it, it, it's a position that's given to somebody of, of some prestige. So that's what his mother did. Um, uh, but you know they were they were they hobnobbed with the wealthy and powerful. Um, Gates's godfather was Horace Walpole, who was the son of the prime minister. So that kind of tells you the circles that they traveled in. And then he joins uh, joins the had the opportunity to join the army, which again, as you said, not everyone who wasn't a noble got there. Uh, but he does become an officer and. Uh, is the Seven Years' War his first, well, oh, we should bring up, uh, he ends up joining the Braddock Expedition. Well, later, but yeah, before that even, he, um, he his parents buy him a commission at age 18, <clears throat> so it's in time for the War of Austrian Succession, so he actually gets involved there, goes over to Nova Scotia, um, is part of the, um, uh, suppression and expulsion of the Acadians in Canada, um, it, which is kind of an interesting story in itself. The Acadians were a bunch of French people who lived on the eastern coast of Canada. Uh, the British wanted to make that land British and thought that having a Canadian population was not a good thing. So they literally take the entire population and kick them out, tell them they have to go somewhere else and expel them from Acadia and move New Englanders up there thinking that that'll stabilize things and there'll never be any problems after that because we have good British colonists moving in. Um, the Acadians actually, but a lot of them end up going down to Louisiana and they become known as the Cajuns later in yeah. um, history. So that's where the Cajuns came from. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's yeah, why so, there's a French quarter in what was for a long time New Spain. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, yeah, Louisiana was French at this time. It only became Spain for a few decades. Oh, that, yeah, but, it just changed hands so many times. I can never remember where to place it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm actually doing an episode on that right now with um, the, the transition from um, France to Spain after the end of the Seven Years' War. Um, but I digress. We're talking about Gates at this point. Um, so, yeah, Gates is fighting in the War of Austrian Succession. Um, making his way up the career ladder in, in the British Army. Uh, one of his early mentors is a, a British officer by the name of Edward Cornwallis, who is the uncle of Charles Cornwallis. So he has a kind of a close association with that family early on. Um, shortly before the, the Seven Years' War begins, he um, gets married in, in Canada to the daughter of a fellow officer. Um, he ends up, and I don't understand this completely, but he, he sells his commission. He has a lieutenancy in the, in the regular army at this point, and he sells his commission and buys a captaincy in what's called a, um, independent regiment of New York, which appears to be, I mean, it's, it, it's more than militia, um, uh, this may be one of those situations where they, they try to have British regular officers commanding uh, colonials or something like that. Um, but he, he does take a captaincy in this this uh, New York regiment um, at this time. Um, but uh, he doesn't stay in New York. He, he is, as you mentioned, he, he goes and joins the Braddock campaign, so which is um, Edward Braddock is is landing in Virginia and trying to march up to capture what eventually becomes Pittsburgh. So 
he, he's part of that whole thing along with a bunch of other youngsters like George Washington and Thomas Gage and uh, Charles Lee and uh, Adam Stevens and Daniel Boone and Daniel Morgan and you know the gang's all there. That's why I brought um, it up. <laughs> yeah. So That's where a lot um, of these relationships are built that would establish the Continental Army in the future. Yeah. And uh, Gates and Washington actually form a pretty um, good relationship at this time. Uh, they they at least get to know each other, um, respect each other as officers. Um, Gates is actually injured pretty early on in the, the attack of the Battle of Monongahela, so he's not involved in most of that day's fighting. Um, and he's actually gets taken out for much of the war, um, recovering from his injuries. Um, he ends up, uh, I think, going back to Britain to, to recuperate. So he, he sits out a lot of the, um, the French and Indian War. Right. But he returns to Britain. And then, uh, lo and behold, just as we oh, discussed. I, I should say near the end of the war, he does go down and takes uh, Martinique along with uh, Richard Montgomery. So those two were involved in that um fighting together as well interesting because i was just go going to say much like richard montgomery like we discussed earlier uh gates returns to britain and he's not nobility and he just doesn't I, i'm under the understanding he doesn't seem to expect any more promotions coming right like a lot of officers his career stagnates after the war he tries to get himself a few positions. He, he's a good administrator, and he tries to get on uh, General Amherst's staff. Amherst is in command of Quebec at the time. Uh, that doesn't work out. Um, eventually, Amherst is replaced by Thomas Gage in Quebec, and Gage and he were buddies, so he tried to you know, work something out with Gage and, and Apparently, he gets in touch with Gage too slowly, and Gage has already filled the positions by the time um, he reaches out to him, because um, Gates is in, in London at this time, or in England. Um, so, you know, by the time he hears about an opening in Quebec and can send a message back saying he's interested in it, months have passed. And uh, so, yeah, he was never really quick enough to get anything. And he, yeah, as he said, he gets sick of this whole thing, and he, he ends up just selling his commission um in 1769 um you know he's just done and, and he um, does what everyone else seems to do when they sell their commission he moves to north america to be a gentleman farmer <laughs> well he got he got some good advice to go to america um he made friends with this guy in london who was a colonial agent um and they got talking a lot about america uh, this guy his name was benjamin franklin maybe you've heard of him um uh, they spend actually a lot of time together in London. They become chess partners and, and hang out with each other. And Franklin advises Gates to go to America, land is cheap, you know, opportunities abound, you know, go west, young man, and grow with the country. Um, so, yeah. Gates go really take, far west. <laughs> yeah, west across the ocean. And um, so, yeah, he... Um, he decides to head to America, and he goes over in uh, 1772, and he looks up his old war buddy, George Washington, um, in Virginia, and tries to get some advice from him. Washington recommends that he settle out in western Virginia on the frontier where you can get lots of cheap land and, you know, build yourself a, a really nice plantation for the, for the money you've got. Not far and from so Charles Lee. And, well, he's not there yet, but yeah. Um, well, but they are uh, the same area of West Virginia. And actually, I believe uh, at least two of George Washington's brothers were were purchasing land in the area. And it's right on the edge of that proclamation line that you're not supposed to cross. <laughs> yeah, I think this is actually over the line, but they didn't really care that much. Well, it, it's and... the thing. <laughs> Again, <laughs> one of the reasons the war, one of the most underappreciated reasons the war breaks out is that. Ohio Valley land. Well, yeah, everybody wanted the Western land. I mean, you know, Washington himself was an investor in these lands, so he definitely wanted to encourage people to go settle them because it made his own property more valuable. Um, but yeah, he, he uh, Gates gets a plantation. And I think it's pretty big. It's like six, seven hundred acres in West, in, in what today is West Virginia. 
um, was then considered part of Virginia um, or part of Quebec or part of Pennsylvania, depending on who you talk to. <laughs> but, uh, maybe part of Connecticut. Yeah, I was going to say just south of what Connecticut thought was Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, in 1772, Gates is settling, setting himself up out there. And um, as you mentioned, Charles Lee moved into the same area a few years later. So they, they become neighbors. Um, Gates does not really get involved in politics particularly, but he, he was a Whig. He did support the general um, position of the Americans on taxation and all that, you know, he, so he, he was definitely there, but he, you know, he doesn't seek elected office or anything like that. I think he, he took a, uh, a position as a Lieutenant Colonel in the, in the Virginia militia, but that, you know, any kind of gentleman with any military background would have done something like that. It was kind right. of considered duty. Um, but when he hears about Lexington, uh, he immediately goes to Mount Vernon and talks to George Washington and says, yeah, whatever you need me for, I'm, I'm up for it. Let's do it. Uh, so on Washington's recommendation, um, he <clears throat> is appointed as a brigadier in the new Continental Army. And more importantly, he's made the adjutant general of the Continental Army. Right, which is a position that's often overlooked. Um and hard to describe. I usually put it as the business of running the army, uh, kind of like the HR department of the Continental Army in a fashion. <laughs> right, he's kind of responsible for organizing everything from the camps to the uniforms to the food to, you know, obviously there are commissary generals and clothier generals and all that, but he kind of oversees all that and kind of coordinates everything. Uh, it's kind of almost like a chief of staff for the president, something like that. Um, it maybe, maybe is a good way to explain it. And um, Gates had done these kind of administrative things in the regular army. So he had a lot of experience. He was good at it. Um, and that's where they put him to work. And, and to his credit, he gets a lot of, of a lot of stuff done, given the limitations in, in terms of what supplies and money they have to, to spend on this army. Um, but he's generally given credit for doing a pretty good job in this area, although he really, really wants to have a, uh, a position as a field commander to get into battle. Because that's face, where that we left off. And happened. yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that's where we left off with Thomas. Is uh, Gates, as we said, was the highest ranking brigadier general, except for real quick when Thomas passes him. Uh, but then Thomas dies. And Gates is sent to take over the Army of Canada and gets to New York and learns there is no army in Canada. Right. Gates gets his um, position as a major general only days or maybe weeks after um, Thomas dies. Um, obviously, Thomas was dying for several weeks before that. Congress became aware of that. And they said, all right, um, Gates is going to go up and replace him. Gates gets his appointment in in June, I believe. Yeah, June of 1776. Um, he's in Pennsylvania at the time. He, so he hears about it immediately because, you know, he's in Philadelphia lobbying for the position. Um, th but there's no delay in him getting the message. He still doesn't get up there until the end of August. Uh, he takes his sweet old time um, making the move from Philadelphia to Quebec. And as you say, by the time he gets almost to Quebec, he realizes there is no army in Quebec. The army is at Fort Ticonderoga at this point. Yeah. Albany is not that far from Philadelphia. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, no. Even it, on horseback. You know, that ride could be made in about three days. Certainly right. if you rode from Camden to Philadelphia in three days, which is a lot farther. We'll get to that in a little bit, but yeah. Oh, yeah, we will get to that. <laughs> so he, so he, he did know how to ride hard when he wanted to. Right. So he moseys on up, finds out there's no army, and this is when he starts getting into some, uh, I'll call them arguments with other leaders of the revolution. Uh, right. Well, Gates says, yeah, no problem. I uh, will take command of the army here and, you know, we'll start arranging our defenses and preparing for the counterattack. Yeah. And General Schuyler, who is his superior officer and in command of New York, says, no, no, you won't. This is an army in New York. It's under my command. Yeah. 
And Gates says, no, this army was given to me. And he said, yeah, if it was in Quebec, it would be yours. Are we in Quebec? No. So it's in New York. I'm the commander of New York. This is under my command. And so they're fighting about this for quite some time, both sending letters to Congress and fussing and fighting about it. And, uh, you know, it's just a whole mess. And meanwhile, Benedict Arnold is there kind of being the voice of reason is what I... I know he's a little yeah. bit friendlier with Skyler, but he's there saying, well, guys, come on, we're on the same team. <laughs> yeah, Arnold is really has a good relationship with both of the men, which is surprising for Arnold because pretty much all of his other fellow officers hate him. But uh, um, well, Arnold, yeah. Arnold thinks we keep saying how like you want to be blaming your superior is how you get ahead in the army. And Arnold is just ter so terrible at the politics that it's the superiors he's like nice to, at least at this point. And it's the, the guys below him, he's uh, kind of not getting along with. He's such a fascinating yeah, so, guy. Yeah, yeah, Arnold gets, for, and we gotta spend a whole episode just talking about Arnold, because he's we just such a fascinating character. But um, yeah, so Arnold is trying to build a fleet on Lake Champlain to stop the British who, you know, are getting ready to invade. Um, he's trying to ignore most of the fighting between Schuyler and, and Gates. Um, he does have a pretty good working relationship with Gates at this time. Uh, Gates uh, helps him um, regain command of the fleet, which he lost at one point. Um, the two men seem to work very well together and, and get along quite well. Um, but, but Arnold is also still on friendly terms with Schuyler, which is kind of unusual because there really is a rift growing between these two guys. And um, um, I understand Gates then, they make a kind of an agreement where Gates takes over running the defenses from Canada or, or Arnold's building this Navy. I, you know, I don't, I, I don't know how to phrase it. They're not really planning an offensive, but they are going to send the Navy out to play aggressive defense. So to speak. Yeah, I mean, they're, they, they, they want to keep control of Lake Champlain. And um, Schuyler, you know, as, as much as he wants to be in command, has never really been a field commander. He is somebody who really focuses on um, politics, negotiation, diplomacy with the Indians, uh, getting all the supplies and logistics in place, all stuff that needs to really get done. And he does a really good job at it, but he's not really doing military command. And so he does... Uh, leave his underling, as he'll be very enthusiastic in telling you, uh, General Gates, in charge of commanding things at uh, Fort Ticonderoga. And Gates, is, that's where Gates is working with Arnold and working on the fleet for Lake Champlain. And Gates is trying to put together the defenses for um, Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, this is all happening in the second half of 1776. Um, Gates eventually gets orders to take part of his army south and join up with George Washington. You know, might remember what's happening at this time. Washington has been pushed out of New York City and is in New Jersey and getting pushed back into Pennsylvania by General Howe's huge, huge army. Uh, General Lee is kind of up to the north of all this, kind of not helping Washington at all and waiting for him to collapse and get destroyed. Um, and Washington is desperately begging for anyone to join him. He needs more soldiers as his army is dissolving. He has less than 2,000 men under his command at this point, um, and many more about to leave. Uh, um, so he reaches out to Gates and says, you know, come down, help me help defend against General Howell's continuing advances. So Gates comes down, and he gets there in mid-December, uh, a few days before Washington's getting ready to launch his attack on um, on Trenton. And um, by this time, General Lee's captured and most of General Lee's army has gotten down there. And with Gates's men, Washington finally feels like he has enough men to launch a counterattack. And Gates is really his man at this point. Lee had been his man, um, you know, an experienced regular officer, but now he's a prisoner of war. So he's turning to Gates. Gates is going to be the man. He's going to be my second in command. We're going to get this done. And Gates says, yeah, no, sorry, not interested. Um, he claims that he's sick. 
and then he needs to go to Philadelphia for some care. Um, kind of gets lost on his way to Philadelphia and rides down to Baltimore, and, which is where the Continental Congress is meeting at the time. And um, he doesn't say exactly why, and there really is no good record as to why. My speculation has always been that he expected Washington's foray into Trenton to fail miserably, which is why he didn't want to be a part of it. And that by being uh, right next to the Continental Congress when it happened, he could say, you know, see, I told you, these are all the things he did wrong. Why don't you put me in command now since, you know, Lee is captured, Washington's gone. Make me commander of the chief of the Continental Army and I'll, I'll go back and save the day. I think that's really what he was expecting and hoping would happen. Right, because we should note oh. that this is at a time where, just like the previous year with Richard Montgomery, enlistments were expiring. Uh, and Washington needed to do a late December uh, or, or December time attack before January 1st when enlistments would ins expire, which had Trenton and Princeton not succeeded after this is after many military failures being chased from New York by the British, uh, then had Tr Prince Princeton and Trenton not worked out and then all these enlistments expired. I mean, the Continental Army would have been in shambles and George Washington yeah. may very well have been uh, replaced. Yeah, there, there would have been no Continental Army after Jan January 1st if he hadn't fought a, a surprise victory and won. And, you know, Washington knew it was completely desperate. And I, I've always kind of been of the opinion that Washington was not particularly confident of victory either, um, but his kind of position was was desperation. Um, you know, either I'm going to win some desperate victory against the odds, or I'm going to die trying. Uh, right. Those are the two options. I'm not going to surrender to the British. I'm not going to turn over my sword and become a prisoner of war and be hanged like a common criminal. Right. I'm going to die like a soldier on the field. Or well, hang that, like a like a, a like a treasonist. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, he literally, the password for um, Trenton was victory or death. Uh, that that was the password that he chose for that night. So, I mean, that tells you a bit of his, his attitude. Um, so, yeah, it was a desperate situation, and Gates didn't want any part of it. He was like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to be part of your death march into, you know, into British cannons. Um, so, yeah, he begged off and, and went to Baltimore. And... Um, and that's about the time the Continental Congress I, I gives, they end up giving Washington a lot more power. I, I don't know what phrase to use. Um, I don't want to say yeah, dictatorial they, powers, but like... Yeah, no, they actually call him dictator. Um, oh, well, but like, yeah, they, it's Washington. They give him full <laughs> dictatorial powers because when, when they fled Philadelphia, they, they were in no position to do anything. So they're like, Washington, do whatever you want. Complete carte blanche. Good luck to you. We're out of here. Tell us how it ends. <laughs> it went pretty well. Uh, so, but, Ga so Gates... Yeah, it was a surprise victory, and Gates, um, unfortunately, messed up all of Gates' plans because he couldn't really sell Washington was a loser after he won that big battle. Ah, shucks, so, I missed it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I really wanted to be with you guys. Sorry, I was <coughs> a little sick there. Um <laughs> But uh, so Gates goes back to his plan B, which is bad mouthing General Schuyler and telling everybody that he should really be put in command of the Northern Army. Uh, and then that doesn't happen. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't. That Congress actually at one point decides to replace Schuyler with Gates and um, votes um, accordingly. And apparently Schuyler throws up fit and threatens to resign and I don't know if there was like some members who were missing from Congress the day of the vote or something but then Congress reverses itself and gives the the army back to Schuyler before Gates can take command so there's there, there really is this back and forth between these two officers for months and it's just it's it's just crazy um, Gates is spending almost all of his time in Philadelphia at this point lobbying Congress making friends with members of Congress develops a really good relationship with the New England delegations, um, which basically makes him the enemy of the 
New York and Atlantic delegations, but uh, you know he's he's building up his faction and hopefully that his his faction is going to win at some point and that he can take command. I understand John Adams was particularly a uh, big supporter of Horatio yes. Gates. Adams really liked Gates, really thought he was the man for the job, that Washington didn't seem to be up to the job. and right. um, Despite and having Gates... been the one to uh, uh, not uh, uh, recommend Washington, nominate Washington in the first place. I don't know if he's really the one who nominated him, but he was certainly yeah. singing well, he says he did. praises. Right. But <laughs> he definitely said uh, that. Although John uh, Adams did a lot of things. Adams likes to write his own history. We're never quite sure, you know, how much of it is completely I know. Accurate. He's a lot of things, but I, like he doesn't seem like a liar. He's, he he offends, it seems to offend people because he tells the truth too brutally. <laughs> you know, so I will take him at his word for that. Uh, but he, as you said, uh, ends up seeing the, as he gets used to warfare, seems to get used to Gates and sees Gates as more, I don't know what, what, what adjective to use, but more, uh, appealing as a general. Yeah, well, I think a lot of the, the luster is off of Washington at this time. And you have to remember, one of the big reasons they picked Washington was not for his military abilities. It was because he was a Virginian and they really wanted to get the southern states or southern colonies at this point um, dedicated to the war effort. Uh, so Washington was kind of a bit of an affirmative action choice, really. He was, he was chosen more for political reasons than for military ability. And they thought that Military experts like Lee and Gates would kind of carry Washington as as a figurehead almost. Um, and when Washington was having failure after failure in the, in the New York campaign, a lot of that luster was completely gone. And they said, "All right, well, it's time to get serious and put an adult in command of the army who you know really has some experience." And since Lee was gone at that point, Gates became the man. So, time elapses. And the following year, we see General uh, Horatio Gates returning to New York. Well, he never actually makes it. Well, he, I guess he goes to New York a couple times, but he's really spending most of 1777 in Philadelphia lobbying right. for positions and stuff. Um, Schuyler is in command in New York. Um, the, the guy who's actually running... Um, um, Fort Ticonderoga at this point is Arthur Sinclair. Right. Um, Anthony Wayne, I think, had been in charge of it for most of the winter. Um, but uh, Sinclair is in charge um, a few weeks before uh, General Burgoyne's army marches out of Canada down Lake Champlain and uh, essentially takes Fort Ticonderoga without a shot. There, there, there's a few shots, but essentially... The Americans see this huge army that's about to completely surround them, and they decide to get out of Dodge before they're all captured. And they they retreat during the night without a single fight, uh, without you know, without putting up any fight. And their their goal at this point is to keep the army alive to fight another day. They right. realize they can't defend Ticonderoga, but they want to keep their army so that at some other point they can take on the British Army. Right. And and real quick in Sinclair's defense, you know, Ticonderoga then as now was kind of in the middle of nowhere. So they, you know, supplying and feeding the army there was very difficult. And he does get uh, uh, absolved of any responsibility or blame with a court martial after this. Yeah. I mean, first of all, he'd only taken command of the fort about two weeks before <laughs> the British attacked. So it's not like he even had a lot of time to do anything. Um, right. I don't want to get the fort. I'm sorry. Yeah, the fort's really in a horrible place. Um, the the British were able to take these heights near the fort where they could put some cannon up. You had the whole Dorchester thing in reverse where the British could fire on the Americans. The Americans couldn't fire back. So they found themselves on the ropes really quickly and they decided to get out of there. Yeah, I love um, I love on your show how frequently you, you mention how for about a century there, everyone in the world thought Fort Ticonderoga was the most strategic place in North America, yet it just keeps changing hands very easily and has basically no strategic value. No one's able to hold it for against much of anything. No, no never. Like, it's there's never shot. Like, the Americans take it in 75, no big deal. <laughs> Car Burgoyne, Burgoyne comes down in 77, no big deal, or... or um. 
I'm getting all my years confused. Either way, it just keeps changing. In the French War, changed hands pretty easily. Um, yeah, I mean, the only people that were ever able to really hold it were the French in that first part of the French and Indian War, the, the battle where um, George Howe got killed. Right. But that was just because of the utter stupidity of the British commander. He tried to take, first of all, he never even got to the fort. He got held up at these heights that were in front of the fort and um, tried to attack them with, with bayonet charges when he really should have used cannon and okay that's a whole other thing yeah. but yeah you're right uh, Fort Ticonderoga proved itself over and over and over to be indefensible and once again it was indefensible uh, for the Americans who had to get out of there to save their their own necks so the British come down Bur Burgoyne comes down and we found ourselves at Horatio Gates's most famous moment though historically it's become Benedict Arnold's most famous moment, but at the time, <laughs> uh, the Saratoga campaign. Right. Horatio Gates is given command. Uh, Schuyler is, you know, Congress says, all right, you lost Ticonderoga, you're out of here. You're, you know, you, you lost our greatest defense of, you know, our Gibraltar of North America. Um, you're, you're gone. Um, so, um, yeah, Gates takes command. Once again, takes forever to get back up to New York to actually take command. So Schuyler remains in command for like another month, month and a half um, while uh, Gates dithers. Um, eventually, Gates gets up there. Schuyler's still there, kind of trying to help out any way he can. All right, you're in command now. Can I give you some advice on what's going on? Gates completely dismisses him, doesn't invite him to the councils of war um, where he's inviting all the other officers. Uh, Schuyler eventually takes the hint and just, um, you know, goes back to stay with his family. Um, so, yeah, Gates is in control um, and he's trying to set up a good defensive point. Um, it, actually, the, the point that he has at Bemis Heights has already been established by um, some continental engineers and he basically decides to put his army there and wait for the British to arrive. Um, it's during this time that his his relationship with with Arnold completely falls apart. Um, when Schuyler leaves uh, office, he has several aides, uh, like a captain and a major or something that Arnold takes onto his staff and Gates sees this as people who are might be anti-Gates officers and he says Arnold get rid of these guys you you know don't have them around it's just not going to happen and Arnold's kind of like no these are good officers I'm keeping them and that basically puts Arnold on Gates's naughty list and that's kind of the end of it after that Gates sees Arnold as an enemy as, as somebody who's part of Team Schuyler and somebody who needs to be eliminated and removed from from his command when he's he's not uh, uh the names of those gentlemen escape me right now but they had served valiantly <laughs> up till that point uh they had served well but they had also said some bad things about gates which got back to right. that so it wasn't like it was just their position they had actually said some things that were obnoxious to the new commander right well whatever that's why they got along with Arnold. <laughs> There's a very but, small handful of humans that got along with Benedict Arnold. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. but They probably but, weren't right. a lot of fun to hang out with. <laughs> well, and the other thing is, by this time, Arnold is... Um, um, he, he's kind of challenging Gates uh, directly. He, he doesn't like Gates' policy of just sitting and waiting for the British to show up. He wants to kind of go on the offensive because he's afraid that the British are just going to flank them and get on the heights behind them and, and possibly crush the entire American army if they just sit there and do nothing. So Arnold really wants to go after them. And at the first Battle of Saratoga, um, Arnold controls the American left wing and does go after the British and almost defeats them. Um, he, he does manage to keep them from, from advancing, uh, but he almost takes out the entire British army at that point and captures them, but he doesn't have enough troops and Gates refuses to send him any reinforcements. And so the British are able to withdraw back to their original positions. 
So it's seen as an American victory, but it could have been a much bigger one. Um, Arnold is very upset with Gates not supporting him. Gates is upset with Arnold for not following his battle plan. Uh, the two men are not getting along at all with each other. Gates sends a bunch of reports back to Continental Congress, which give credit to everybody except Arnold. Um, and the two men just get into this huge thing. Gates ends up taking away part of Arnold's um, already co command that he already thought was too small. He moves like Morgan's riflemen and stuff to the completely over to the other right side of the American lines where, where they're completely useless. Arnold's like, you're just deliberately tying hands behind my back at this point so that you'll hope I fail. You know, do you, do you want to win this war or not? You know, um, and, and they, the two men are literally getting into shouting matches at this point. They're just screaming at each other. And, you know, Gates is basically saying, you know, I'm not doing anything for you. Why don't you leave? Why don't you go back to Philadelphia and tell your complaints to Congress? Because I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do anything about it. Um, Arnold doesn't leave, but he just kind of sits in his tent and fumes. He has no command at this point, nothing to do. Um, we get up to the point of the second battle of Saratoga. Um, Gates leaves strict orders to Arnold to stay in his tent, to stay out of this battle. He is to have no part in it. Arnold says, screw you, gets on his horse, goes out, takes command of troops that he has no legal authority to take command of, but they all know him as a great fighter and he effectively wins the second battle of saratoga he was already um, a hero to them yeah um so when saratoga yeah. becomes the great american hero that benedict yeah, arnold and, should have been and, and the other point that is always made here which we, we've kind of passed right over was um um Burgoyne had a whole second army that was was marching through the western part of the state that was supposed to join up with him there. And Ar this was before Gates even took command. This was while Schuyler was still in command. Arnold ran up to Fort Stanwix with an inferior force, a force that was smaller than the force he was facing, and managed to force them to retreat and flee from the field and run back to Canada. Oh, yeah. So he, <laughs> he had this, before we even get to the first and second battles of Saratoga, Arnold had done a huge part in weakening the British defenses, and then he effectively wins the first and second battles of Saratoga against Gates's orders, and gets zero credit for the whole thing. Gates yeah, says, we oh, we yeah, will. Arnold got Arnold got injured, but you know. Yeah, we will do an entire episode on Benedict Arnold. Don't you worry, because he is a hero. Uh, but right. yeah, as you as you were just saying. Uh, the the battle's over. Gates sends his his guy James Wilkinson, who is his own set of, set of stories later on. Uh, yeah. James Wilkinson hustles back to the Continental Congress to say, "Hey, Gates is the hero of Saratoga," and that's what they believe. <laughs> yeah, and and Gates almost um, pulls defeat from the jaws of victory here um, when uh, Burgoyne surrenders. Uh, Gates basically gives him a complete pass and says, you know what, if you surrender, um, we'll let you take your entire army back to England. We're not going to take you prisoner. Um, and you just have to promise not to come back to America, which is a really stupid, stupid thing, because, of course, the British Army is has soldiers all over the empire. So all they have to do is take the few thousand soldiers that are in India or in England or Ireland or something and put Burgoyne's army there and then send that other army to America and they've complied with with Gates's restrictions so it's it's a stupid way to you know allow the surrender to occur and uh, fortunately for the Americans the Continental Congress and George Washington basically ignore the terms and they, they come up with legalisms and excuses for why they didn't comply but basically they end up keeping the army prisoner anyway uh, regardless of what Gates promised them. So, yeah, Gates almost screwed up the entire victory at Saratoga with his terms of surrender. Right. But he is considered a hero by his colleagues at the time. So, right. where does he go from here? <laughs> so, he's, he's the hero of Saratoga, and he's basically hanging out in upstate New York, taking on all of his laurels. John Adams is singing his praises, the New England delegation is, um, and a lot of Congresses. At this point, you know, Gates has won Saratoga, supposedly, and 
George Washington has lost Philadelphia. So Gates winner, Washington loser. Um, there's more and more calls for, you know, maybe it's time to replace, uh, you know, this dilettante from Virginia with a real soldier with real experience. And um, he's not even a really lot... part of the elite. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's some some hick who, who married well. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so there, there there's the biggest threat to Washington's career happens at this point, the Conway cabal, which um, we've, we've mentioned a bit before, uh, which basically was the Continental Congress trying to decide internally without actually saying it, should we replace George Washington as commander of the Continental Army? And the way they go about it is they appoint General Gates to be the new head of the Board of War. Now, the Board of War had always existed, but it had existed up until this point basically as a congressional committee. Uh, John Adams had been the head of the Board of War, um, but they're really redefining the board at this point. They want to put professional military officers in charge of it. Um, but the Board of War oversees the, the military. So this, you know, these were the people who were telling George Washington what to do. And so now you're taking a subordinate officer to George Washington and putting him in a civilian command where he is the superior to George Washington. So it's really creating this difficult dynamic to decide who's really in charge. And a lot of people were kind of thinking George Washington might just get disgusted and resign and make the whole thing go away. Or if not, we'll see if, you know, Gates gives him good orders. And if Gates does a really good job, we'll just kind of pile more and more um, um, support for Gates and, you know, essentially make him the commander by making him the head of the Board of War and giving him all this power and authority. And uh, Thomas Mifflin, who's another important general, joins the Board of War as well. Uh, Thomas Conway, who's another enemy of Washington, becomes the Inspector General. So they're really kind of putting everything against George Washington. And eventually the whole thing unravels. It doesn't go well um, for Gates. Um, yeah, well, Washington, no, I'm sorry. Ahead. I was going to say, Washington gets some. Um, correspondence that takes place between Conway and Gates that basically says out loud the thing that everybody is saying in private, which is that Washington is incompetent and Gates should really become the commander. And Washington kind of makes public this, this correspondence. And Gates just gets outraged by this. He says, who the hell is going through my private correspondence? Uh, you know, this, this is not completely unacceptable. And he very strongly suspected that Alexander Hamilton was to blame because Hamilton had been up in New York uh, with Gates a few weeks prior to this um, kind of conveying General Washington's orders slash pleas that Gates, please send more soldiers down to Valley Forge to, to help support the main army since there wasn't a British army to face in New York anymore and Gates didn't really want to send any soldiers down. So anyway, Hamilton had been up there uh, Gates suspected that Hamilton had gone through all of his papers, and so he's arguing about all this. Eventually, it turns out that Gates owns aid, the um, uh, Wilkinson, Mr. Wilkinson uh, Colonel Wilkinson, um, who really wanted to be made a general when he reported the news of the victory to um, um, uh, Congress, but didn't. Um, um, it turns out that Wilkinson had revealed the information. Yeah. And Wilkinson, by the way, he took like a month and a half to get down and give the news to, from Saratoga to Continental Congress. They, of course, heard about it through other channels by then. Yeah. And um, Wilkinson would later go on to be the senior officer of the United States Army while serving as a double agent for Spain. Agent. Oh, yeah. Agent 13. He now, was... this is 20 years later. We're jumping way ahead here. Oh, yeah, no, if we want to get into the future, he commits complete treason and then yeah. drops the dime on Aaron Burr to get out of it. Yeah, yeah, so we're not even going to get into that, but James... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Wilkinson is a scumbag extraordinaire. Yeah, uh, yeah, Slippery Jim is how they've referred to him at the uh, American Revolution <laughs> Mohawk Valley Conference. So. But, but yeah, so anyway, yeah, Wilkinson is the one who revealed this information. He didn't do it deliberately to, like, undercut uh, his boss or anything. 
he was basically having discussions with um who was it uh lord sterling uh, was it lord sterling i think it was lord sterling uh, it, it was a, it was an yeah it was it might have been it was an american general it was um, someone who went immediately to washington it was like dude look at this <laughs> yeah he was he was trying to gain support for general gates's becoming the new commander so he was kind of feeling out these other generals and stuff um this was so he stopped and had was having these conversations while he was supposed to be delivering the message of victory of saratoga to to, to the continental congress um and of course yeah some of washington's allies say hey do you know this guy's going around <laughs> saying all this stuff about you and um so the whole thing blows up um it that doesn't really end the thing. Um, Gates is still in command of the Board of War and is still trying to kind of run things. And he proposes this new invasion of Quebec, um, which is supposed to take place in 1778. And Washington's like, seriously, you're, you're going to do this? This is idiotic. It, it, he doesn't say anything openly. He says things to friends about this is complete idiocy. But it's like, hey, you know, yeah. Continental Congress wants to do it. It's their army. They're allowed to do whatever they want. Well, yeah, you and what army? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they put um, they put General Conway in command, and Lafayette is going to support him. Or, or I guess Lafayette was actually the titular commander, but they put Conway as his aide, and they think, oh, this you know twenty year old boy general is going to listen to General Conway and all this stuff, and. Um, Lafayette immediately blows up the whole plan. He he basically says, "No, I don't want Conway. I want a, a different general, and you know I'm going to be running the show and and all this stuff." And he gets up to I think Albany is where they're going to be launching it from. He finds there's no army, there's no supplies, no food, no guns, no ammunition, no nothing. Um, I think it was uh, Sullivan was supposed to be one of the top commanders. Like he doesn't even show up until weeks later. And he was told, you know, that he, Lafayette was under the impression he was going to arrive with an army. And Sullivan's like, no, no one told me to raise an army. I was just told to come here and help you out. I so you brought like, the army. No, you were supposed to bring the army. Wait, wait, wait. I thought you had the army. <laughs> everybody forgot to bring the army. Um, and, you know, they had. There was just zero logistics. This was just like a, a complete shit show from the very beginning. It was just a, a huge mess. Um, and, and, you know, you can see Washington sitting in Valley Forge going, yeah, you guys don't know how to run an army. Right. This is just funny. Well, that's um, the whole point of the board of war is to make sure you can carry out these operations. Right. Like we said, Gates was at this point a former adjutant general. Like. He's the one who's supposed to know how to operate the business of war. Right. And he does nothing. And, and the, whole, the whole thing blows up. Lafayette walks away and says, yeah, we're not, we're not even going to try because, you know, you want me to walk up there by myself and ask the British to surrender? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so it makes Gates look like an idiot, which he was. And it basically secures Washington's position because they don't see Gates as a viable alternative to Washington anymore. And that's it for Washington, any challenge to Washington's authority for the remainder of the war. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that the Conway Cabal really did bring out was how wide and deep Washington's support was within the Continental Army. The officers had really grown to respect him as a leader um, and, Congress realized that if they tried to get rid of Washington, they could very well lose their entire army and or the army could turn against them. Um, so Washington's position became very secure very fast after that time. Yeah, that's what I've come to understand, too, about the Conway Cabal is the Cabaliers or whatever you'd call them, the conspiracy. Uh, they really thought, oh, there's a lot of people are going to back us on this. And very quickly, as soon as they started trying to recruit people, because that's what happened. Wilkinson tried to recruit someone into the conspiracy who went immediately to Washington. Suddenly, this handful of people thought that they could get a lot of people to support Gates very quickly realized, oh, no, no, no. No one's with us. <laughs> Everyone's with, when it came to the army, at least, uh, everyone, most were with Washington. So, right. 
Does it go well? Conway, we'll talk about Conway next time. He ends up getting in a duel and getting shot in the face, but we eventually will <laughs> get to him on well, our he, list of major generals. Right. He resigns. Mifflin resigns. whole bunch of people resign. <laughs> Gates, do not, Gates does not resign. Gates remains head of the Board of War. Um, and everybody just kind of sits there and say, all right, you can be head of the Board of War and sit there in Philadelphia and we'll pretty much ignore you. Right. And so he really gets ignored for the next couple of years. He's, he really is doing much of nothing. Well, the exact opposite of what Congress was thought they were doing with the Board of War is what happened. They thought the yeah. Board of War was going to tell Washington what to do. And very quickly, they learn, no, it's, it's kind of a pointless office now. Um, right. So Gates hangs out there for a few years and then eventually wants to, uh, I believe he wants to take to the field either way, whether he wants to or not, he is eventually sent to take over the Eastern department for a handful of uh, months. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, where, you know, basically new England and not much is going on there. Yeah. He was up there for a brief time. He bounces around a few places. He's, he's up in New York for a while and, 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 yeah, but he's basically given positions that are far away from anywhere that anything important might be happening. Right. Well, until South Carolina, or I should say uh, Charleston, is captured. Right. In 1780, um, Benjamin Lincoln, who's been in command for um, of the Southern Department for almost two years, has an army of 5,000 men at Charleston. Uh, the British go down capture Charleston and capture most of the army. The army doesn't escape this time. Uh, and it's probably, I think, the biggest American loss of the war. Uh, they lose an entire army in the South. And all of a sudden, all of the Southern colonies are at risk. Uh, they may fall to the British. And you know, everything south of Virginia, or maybe even south of Maryland, may quickly become part of the British Empire once again. So they pull General Gates out of mothballs and say, General Gates, this is your chance to prove yourself. You're a great military leader. You're our hero of Saratoga. We're going to give you a chance to redeem yourself, and you're going to go down and save us all by destroying the British in the Southern Command. And How does that go? He gets a not a very big army. I think it's only a, maybe one or two thousand continental soldiers, and then he's joined by another couple of thousand uh, southern militiamen. Um, but his army is a little bit bigger than the British army that he's facing under General Cornwallis, and uh, he ignores most of the advice of his lower officers and decides he's going to just march straight at Cornwallis through a bunch of swamps and just, you know, hit him head on and, and win this thing. Um, marching through swamps for weeks in August in the Carolinas is not the best thing for your health. Um, most of his army gets dysentery. Uh, he doesn't bother to bring along enough food to feed his army while they're down there, so most of them are starving to death. He wants to get there quickly, so he does a bunch of night marches, so they're sleep deprived. So by the time he gets to Camden, he has a few thousand really sick, really hungry, really tired soldiers, and he says, all right, let's go fight. Um, and Cornwallis, of course, has built some really good defenses. He's put his men in some good flanking positions, and you know, Cornwallis just mops the floor with the Continentals. Uh, he, um, hundreds are killed, um, many more hundreds are captured. Most of the army is completely destroyed. Um, those who aren't just flee for their lives. Um, this army is just completely decimated. Um, General Gates uh, was not in any danger of capture because General Gates never takes to the field. He likes to fight by sitting in a um, headquarters miles back behind the actual fighting. So he just kind of gets reports about what's happening and then sends out orders to you know, tell the soldiers what to do. So Gates easily gets away from the uh, um, losses, but he's pretty much on his own at this point. He's, he's lost his entire army. And so he decides he should just ride north to Philadelphia and makes the ride from Camden, South Carolina to Philadelphia in a record three days. 
So he's just, he's really hauling ass. And um, just, you know, he, I, I think he wanted to get back to Philadelphia so he could put his own spin on what happened and explain that it wasn't his fault, that it was that he was saddled with all this crappy militia that didn't know how to fight and whatever. But he gets to Philadelphia and they're like, dude, you can't just abandon your army in the field and come back to here to whine to us. You know, so it's not only the fact that he lost, it's the fact that he just kind of ran away from his army without anything, without trying to do anything to like salvage his men or help recover or retreat or anything. Just, you know, running back to Philadelphia. And at that point, you know, he was done. Uh, Congress is like, all right, you, you, don't, you don't know what you're doing. Why did you even uh, come here? Yeah. So we'll get the court martial ready for you. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> right. They say there, there needs to be a court of inquiry. Uh, Gates does, is not given another command. And he ends up going back to his uh, plantation in West Virginia, uh, uh, and basically just living there for a year. But he doesn't resign his commission. He, he continues to serve. Well, he doesn't serve, but he continues to draw a salary as a major <laughs> general of the Continental Army. Um, Don't worry. They weren't paying anyone, really. So yeah, it yeah, right. it's only, only would have been paper money anyway. But, <laughs> yeah. um, so a year goes by. There never is a court of inquiry, so they never really look at it. But after about a year, they decide that he needs to go, and this is after Yorktown is over. Um, this is 1782. They decide to send him up to Newburgh, New York, where the Continental Army is just kind of sitting and waiting for the uh, uh, British to leave New York, uh, for you know, for all the paperwork to be signed and for the war to be over. So he goes up there. I don't know why, really, that he spends a few months there and really doesn't do anything except stir up dissent and problems with the soldiers who are already pretty mutinous. Um, his wife dies about this time. He actually goes home for a brief time from Newburgh back to Virginia because of his wife is dying um, and then returns to Newburgh. He then spends a few months trying to hit on um, Janet Montgomery, um, who's a widow at this point. And she basically blows him off and no, I'm not getting with you, old man. Right. Um, the aforementioned Richard Montgomery's uh, widow. Right. Um, so yeah, he basically hangs out in Newburgh until the end of the war. Um, he, he does marry a wealthy widow, which kind of sets him up for his old age, but he, he returns to his plantation in Virginia. Um, doesn't do much of anything after the war, at least he, he doesn't get involved in politics or the government or anything like that. He, he did serve as vice president of the Society of Cincinnati, which was the, the organization for revolutionary war officers. Um, George Washington was the president of it. Um, that's really the only thing of significance that he did. Yeah, I know he does actually, I know he, he ends up spending his last few years, he lives a kind of a long time. He lives till the uh, 1807. So he sees most of yeah. Jefferson's presidency. Um, I yeah. know he does end up moving to New York uh, for the last yeah. 15, 20 years. And he does, he has like, I think one or two sessions, he's elected to the New York state legislature, which I know isn't a big deal, but you know, it was the only, uh, the only time he actually spent in government that I'm aware of. Yeah. He, and I only um, know that because I live in New York. <laughs> he, he does move out of Virginia in 1790 and, and moves to a, a smaller state on in Manhattan, it's actually it's a country estate where Madison Square Garden currently is. Right. So, uh, you know, New York wasn't what it is now either. Um, no, but, that's yeah. true. It was the same size. Well, that's actually not even true. It was a different size. Yeah, I mean the geography the same. It wasn't water like most of Boston was at the time, right. but it was it was all farmland. It wasn't you know the city ended at you know what we consider the bottom of lower Manhattan really at this point, like Wall Street or something. It's right. like the northern tip of really where the city was. Um, so yeah, he has a country estate in kind of the you know middle of the island in Manhattan. It's, it's a nice place. And, and he, as you say, dabbles in politics. 
he also a lot of his story also gives him credit for freeing all of his slaves when he uh, left Virginia. Uh, he didn't really do that. Um, it, he actually sold the slaves as part of the plantation, but he gave um, he put a provision in there that after five years, um, all the adults would be freed and that um, the remainder the younger slaves would continue to work as slaves until they reached the age of 28 and then would be freed. So he did arrange for their eventual freedom, but it's not like he just granted them all their emancipation one day and, and right. moved on. Well, that that uh, is essentially how New York went about it. Uh, no, that's the opposite, actually, how New York. New York said uh, all, in 1799, all children of slaves born after today are free. And anyone already alive will be free in 28 years. So, I mean, we did talk a lot of trash about Horatio Gates today. So in this situation, we should at least give him a, a half a thumbs up <laughs> at the end there for trying to manumit his uh, enslaved servants eventually. I mean, it was better than nothing, but he could have given them immediate emancipation. I, um, yeah, I, I know. I, under, I understand. He can, he can say the same thing about George Washington, who only freed his slaves in his will, and even then he said, well, you have to wait until Martha dies. Right. We could say um, that about a gigantic slew of the people we discuss on this channel. Again, right. most people we don't talk, like we don't point our nose down at quite as much as we've done with Horatio Gates this afternoon. So... We'll at least no, give him that. The only point I'm making is I'm not giving him full credit for emancipating all of his slaves. He right. did sell them and he did make money off of the, their sale, even if he did give them some eventual hope of freedom. Fair enough. Um, Horatio Gates, you get absolutely zero points today from any of it. But you're right. He does move to New York. Um, yeah, I don't think he does much of anything there. He, he, he is involved in politics a little bit. Yeah. Um, as you said, he, I think he served one term in the legislature. Um, and he decides to break with his old buddy, John Adams. Um, Adams, when he becomes president, um, Gates is not happy with a lot of his policies. He sees Adams as being too close to his old enemy, Alexander Hamilton. And uh, Gates actually ends up supporting Thomas Jefferson in the election of 1800, right. um, which, of course, annoys Adams to no end, and the two men never speak again. So, Typically. you know, he, he, right, you know, that was basically the end of that. He, he did, as you said, I think he lived until 1806, so he saw most of Jefferson's administration, um, and he died as an old man in his bed, I think at age 79. So that was the end of General Gates. And that's Horatio Gates. And that is the three major generals, what, what we might call the, I don't call them the second tier of major generals, but the second round of major generals second appointed round. in the Continental mm -hmm. Army. Uh, next time, we will be discussing the handful of major generals all thrown into the action on, I think it was August 9th of 76. Six? Yes. Yes. Okay. August 9th, 76. Next week, that's what we'll be discussing. As of now, uh, Michael, thank you again for coming. Uh, everyone listening, if you especially check out the American Revolution podcast, especially uh, Michael, you you did several weeks on the Saratoga campaign. And it's absolutely fantastic. So if you want to learn more about Arnold and Gates and that relationship and the finer details of those engagements, especially uh, the, the Fort Stanwix confrontation that Arnold has that we mentioned. I highly recommend checking that out. Um, thank you again. And uh, I will be back with another founder tomorrow. And Michael Troy will be back with us next week.